OK, so that's just a quick overview of essentially the type system that you have with AIDL. And uh, using those basic building blocks, then we can make all kinds of other interesting things. I did a little, uh, little experiment just for fun. I ran a search through all the Android source code to see how often they use AIDL interfaces. And I found hundreds and hundreds of examples of where it's used in the frameworks. It's used a little bit less over in the apps and providers portion of the packages directory, but it's still used there as well. It's used probably a dozen or so times, but it's used hundreds of times in the main part of Android, which means that you are often accessing stuff as a, an app developer in Android that is using AIDL in one way or another. So getting, getting to know how it works is, is useful. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is how you go about actually implementing uh, AIDL interfaces using, using Eclipse and then kind of talk about sort of what's going on under the hood. Now, some of what we're going to talk about here is not strictly necessary. You can get a long way in life as an Android developer and not know some of the things I'm going to tell you. But I want to show some of it to you because I think it's interesting to learn how it works. And as I mentioned last time, it's also useful because it helps you appreciate the tedious and error-prone programming you're not doing because it's done for you by having an AIDL compiler. All right, first let's talk about how you use Eclipse. So basically what you do, it's really easy. Uh, if you're not using Eclipse, there's a few other steps you may have to do. But if you're using Eclipse, it's really simple. You go ahead and create a bunch of AIDL files. So here's an example where I've got AIDL files that are um, in my source directory. And, and you can organize this as you see fit. One common way to do it is you might put your AIDL files in a separate subfolder underneath the source folder so that you can have the AIDL files separate from the normal Java files. That's just one thing you can do. And so what Eclipse will then do is it'll go ahead and automatically compile every file it finds in the source directory that isn't a .AIDL file. And it sticks those files, which are then converted into Java files, in the gen directory. So source and gen are basically peers. They're siblings at the same level of the the directory hierarchy of, of Eclipse and uh, the, the way that packages and, and projects work and so on. And so if you go take a look at, if you very quickly take a look at the gen directory after you plop AIDL files into the source directory, you will discover that the IDL, IDL compiler has run and it's created Java files on your behalf. And the Java files contain a bunch of things, and we'll talk about them. One thing they contain is an actual interface, a Java interface that corresponds to your interface. And that's very important for what you're doing. Then they also contain a couple of other things as well. They also contain a stub, which are gonna be, is going to be used by the service that implements this thing. Or it doesn't always have to be a service. Whoever the, the implementer is of the interface will be relating to the stub. And there's also something called a proxy. And that's what the client will be using. Now, when you're dealing with just conventional synchronous communication between activities and services, or services and services, then in that case, the, the proxy is typically used by the activity or the client. And the stub is used by the service. But as we'll see, when we start doing asynchronous calls, the concept of client and service gets flipped around a little bit. And so you actually may have an activity that is also implementing a stub. And that's so it can get callbacks that come back to it from the service, which is invoking one-way methods on callback objects that were passed to it. And we'll talk about that, and I'll show you the examples. That, that's one reason why I wanted to skip the quiz so I could cover all that stuff in detail. OK, and if you take a look at the documentation here, you'll find out lots more information about how AIDL works. Now, there's a lot of different moving parts here, and it helps to break them down by a number of different criteria. So let's kind of do this. Assuming we have an interface like the iDownload interface, then we're going to go ahead and have a couple of different kinds of entities involved. And when you take a look at your implementation, when you take a look at the generated code, you'll see all of these things and how they, they appear. So I'm just going to give you a high level view first. So there's some stuff that comes out of Android, out of the box. There's this iBinder interface that's defined as part of Android. There's a binder class, which is defined as part of Android. The binder is typically something that's local. And the iBinder is an interface that allows you to be able to access something whose implementation may, in fact, be remote, where remote means in a separate process. So those are the things that Android gives you out of the box. They're always available. Then there are certain things that are generated by the AIDL compiler. So the AIDL compiler will generate this stub class that's, that's nested inside of 
this other interface we're going to talk about later. And then there's also a proxy class, which is nested inside the stub for various reasons. And we'll see how those guys get used in a second. And then finally, what you do as an implementer of the service that wants to define this interface, that wants to provide an implementation of this interface, you come along and you inherit from the generated stub and you override the methods that were defined in the interface so that you give implementations that are meaningful in whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, and it turns out that this particular hierarchy here, the one that goes like this, these are all service related kinds of things. And then the proxy is something that the client uses. So the client uses the proxy. The other service side, the server side, which, which might be a service or it may be a service that's a callback service, those things are inheriting from, from the, uh, the binder hierarchy. And there's a real nice uh, tutorial out there that talks about all this stuff. There are lots of great tutorials, by the way, on, on Binder so if, in, in AIDL. So if there's anything you're confused about in my conversation, you might want to take a look. And there's lots more material out there you can take a look at. So let's take a little bit of time and, and kind of look at what actually is spit out by the AIDL compiler, because it's kind of cool. So you'll see that um, what happens is that there's this interface that's generated. And that extends this uh, I interface class our interface. Uh, and then there's a static abstract class called a stub. And as you can see here, it extends the binder. And it also implements your interface. So in our case, that was the, the iDownload interface, which has the download image method. So there's a class called stub. And it inherits from binder. And it implements the download interface. Uh, and then basically, this is this thing that's going to be sort of on the implementation side of the, the house. And then there's a constructor for stub that's going to go ahead and register an instance of this object with the underlying binder framework. So that's how the binder framework knows that you've got an object that needs to be dispatched. It registers it by using this thing called attach interface. There's also another method that's very important. We see this getting used a couple different places called as interface. And as interface is used by, typically used by the on service connected hook method that gets called back by the Android binder framework and the, the bound service framework when the on bind method returns. And what that does is it allows you to take a binder object, which, or an iBinder object, which is what comes back from the server side, the service side, and be able to narrow it or downcast it down to the appropriate underlying uh, uh, interface that we're trying to define here, which, which in our case would be the iDownload service. And you can see it, it's got a bunch of gobbledygook code here where it's trying to check to see whether we need to have a proxy made or whether we're the server side, whatnot. And if we need a proxy, which we're going to in this case, it goes ahead and it says new iDownload.stub.proxy obj. And that creates a proxy. And we'll look at the proxy on the next page, well, two, two pages from now. Um, in fact, let me, I'll tell you what. Let's go look at the proxy real quick, and I'll come back and talk about the other stuff. So here's what the proxy looks like. The proxy is nested inside of the stub. And basically what the proxy does is the proxy is going to stash away the iBinder. And then it's going to use it shortly. And it's going to use it when the client calls the method through the proxy, the method in our case being download image. So when the client calls download image on the proxy, what happens, as you can see here, is it takes in the string, which is the URI. And this, this code, by the way, is all auto-generated by the AIDL compiler. And as you can see when you look at it, it's pretty, pretty low level and nasty. And what it's essentially doing is it's creating a pair of parcels to contain the data that we're going to send over there and to get the reply back. It's creating these two parcels. And then it's going ahead and it's going to take the URI that we pass in and it's going to write it as a string into the underscore data parcel. So that what that's basically doing is it's copying the, the bytes in our URI that coming, is coming from the client side into this parcel, which keeps track of its type and other metadata. And then it goes ahead and it calls this method called transact. And we'll, we'll cover that in a second. And what transact does is it says, here's the operation that I want performed. I want to do the transaction download image operation. 
And here's the data it should work on, which in this case is the string containing the URI. And here's where I want you to put the reply. And we'll see what happens in a second in that method. And then when it's done, when this thing returns, we take the reply and we copy its result as a string into underscore result. And that's what we return as the return value from that particular method. So as I, as I say here, I, I simplified this ever so much just because I wanted to um, make sure that you would be able to follow along with what it's doing without getting it too complicated. Here then is the method called in response to the call to transact. So as you can see here, we call download image. That calls uh, mRemote, which is the remote binder object or a proxy to it, uh, transact. That ends up calling back in the stub the onTransact method. And you can see what onTransact does is it takes a look at the code. And keep in mind the code is shown over here. Here's the code that was passed in, the transaction download image. And it has a bunch of stuff. I'm just showing the part that's important. It says, if this is the transaction on download image or download image case, then go ahead and read its data string and then invoke an up call on the actual implementation method that was defined by the user who subclassed this whole thing in the first place. And we'll look at that in a couple slides. That's the actual call that does the actual work. And so it demarshals the parameter and passes it to the callback. And then what it comes back here is a string. And it marshals that up as a string. And then that gets sent back over to the, the client as the reply. OK, so any questions about that? So that's basically the set of things that the proxy and stub are doing under the hood to do stuff like register you. So here's. I'll highlight this guy to go ahead and, and register these stub instances, these, these binder objects, so that they can be dispatched ultimately by the, by the binder framework. It has a way of being able to take an iBinder and turning it back into an interface. As part of that process, it may have to create a proxy. The proxy is an object that has a method that has the same name as the receiver, but when it's invoked, it, it doesn't do the work, it goes ahead and marshals the parameters, calls this transact method to pass them over, and then when it comes back, it takes the return value and then cracks it open and returns it back to something that's expected by the, the caller. So notice what's going on here is that this is Java land, and this is sort of gobbledygook passing data around possibly between different languages land, and so this is the linearization stage. So I think I mentioned before that what a what a proxy does is it converts a method call into a message. And that message is something that represents the information in the method call so that it can be passed over to a receiver. And that receiver doesn't have to be written in the same language. It doesn't run in the same address space, and so on and so forth. So it gives you flexibility to pass information correctly and efficiently across processes. The receiver side, the stub side, gets called back as the objects come up from underneath the binder framework in libbinder. And the onTransact method is called. And that does this stuff. And that ends up ultimately calling the download image method that we have to implement as the people who want to define this service. So let's take a look at that part. So, so now that we've talked about the generated proxy and the generated stub, let's talk a bit more about what you actually do to use this stuff. Everything I've talked about for the past 10 minutes, you really don't have to know in order to use what I'm talking about. But it's useful to sort of understand the principles. And by the way, if you use other technologies like Corba or Microsoft Com or other things like Enterprise Java Beans, they're doing essentially the same kind of thing. The patterns that they use, which would be stuff like the proxy pattern, the adapter pattern, the broker pattern, and so on, those are all the same patterns. It's just different realizations in different languages, in different middleware frameworks in different ways. OK, so if you take a close look at the generated code, by the IDL compiler, you'll see that there's an abstract method called, or the, a set of abstract methods, one for every method that was defined in the original AIDL interface. So if we have download image, then there's going to be an abstract method called download image here. And we have to implement this. And you either implement it by subclassing from stub or creating an anonymous inner class or subclassing and then forwarding, you know, however you want to do it. When 
somebody has to implement download image to do the, the thing that you actually want to have get done. So here's what you do. You start out by typically creating a private instance of an, the AIDL generated subclass. And again, there's various ways to do this. The most common way you'll typically see people do it is they'll go ahead and use this format where you make a new anonymous object and you give the implementation here, just like you guys are doing. And that gets created somewhere, either in the onCreate method or it gets created at class scope or whatnot. And you then fill in the implementation of this stuff as you see fit, either implementing it directly or delegating it to somebody else to do the work. And then the final thing you do is you make sure that that object is returned as the result from the onBind method. So that binder, which implements this interface, is going to get returned back to the caller. And, and we'll see later, th you know, think about how this comes back to you. This comes back via the on-service connected call. It'll come back as, a, as an iBinder. And then you're going to go ahead and say, hey, take this thing and treat it as an interface, which will narrow it down using a proxy to get you back away to talk to the interface itself. All right, so let's kind of see how all of these pieces actually work end to end. Because there's a lot of moving parts, and some of them are pretty easy to understand. Some of them are harder to understand. Not all of them you have to understand, but I'm going to show you how it works sort of end to end to a certain level of, of detail. So here we have a client. The client's going to go ahead and call uh, download image on the stub.proxy. So we've got this proxy, and it's going to say download image. And as we saw, that's going to convert the parameter and the return result into parcels. And those are going to get used to pass to mremote.transact. And that's going to take the data that goes there, and it's going to be submitted via a lower level mechanism, probably written in you know, native code at some level, uh, that works atop the underlying Linux operating system. And it uses an, an IO control, an, an IOCTL, which is basically a way of passing information to the low level device drivers. The low level device driver in this particular case, of course, is the binder driver. And that's the guy that knows how to move the data back and forth between sender and receiver. The data comes up on the other side, which causes the thread that's sitting there waiting for the data to unblock from a call to IOCTL, from IOCTL. And keep in mind, there's a pool of threads, and they just take turns waiting for work to do. And so some thread is chosen. It's, it's turned to run. And it takes the data, which is pretty low level at this point, and it goes ahead and cracks it open, looks inside it, and figures out which binder object is this actually for. And it uses that information that was registered earlier when we called the, the attach interface method on the stub, or that was called for us by the constructor of the stub. It uses that information to go find the appropriate binder object and call its on transact hook. And the on transact hook, as we saw, does the demarshalling of the parameter. And it goes ahead and it invokes the up call, it's called an up call, to the download image method on our particular service. So that goes ahead and, and does its work. Now, I don't show the next set of things, but what will happen is uh, on the way out of that method callback, on the way back from that up call, the result is taken. So when, when download image returns a string, the generated stub takes that string, stuffs it back into the parcel that it was sent along with the original call to on transact. And then it unwinds the whole thing. It goes backwards. So it'll return everybody on blocks. And we end up ultimately back at the original call site. And the result comes back as a return value from the download image invocation on the proxy itself. So the proxy blocks, it looks just like a regular method call, just like a regular two-way method call. But in fact, the processing was done by a different method in a different process for the object that was the target of that invocation. And that's what's commonly known as remote procedure call, or remote method call, or some variant on that. OK, any questions about that? So it's, it's a good thing to know how all these things work. By the way, uh, lest you think that this is only limited to things running on the same, the same hardware platform, like the device, uh, obviously there's a long, long history going back to the 70s and 80s of people doing remote procedure call where you span network boundaries. And the abstractions are more or less the same as what we're talking about here. It's just that you can talk to things that are on actually physically different hosts connected by a network. Android's AIDL and binder RPC does not work that way. 
but the various RPC mechanisms you might use if you were to use, say, web services or other types of middleware built in to, on top of the underlying mechanisms, you can use those to talk from an Android device to something else using a remote procedure call as well. There's a very nice article here that gives more information about binders and, and shows lots of examples and uh, more code you can look at to see how all the various pieces fit together. Something else that's important to talk about in this context is the issue of, of call semantics. So what are the appropriate call semantics for uh, the AIDL and binder RPC mechanisms? And it turns out there's a couple subtleties here that you need to be aware of. So if you are in the same address space and you invoke an operation on, on a, through a proxy, what that does is that ends up just being a direct method call to the receiver which is in the same address space. So if you're calling in the main thread of control, the UI thread, the call will actually be run in the main thread of control. So it's just borrowing, <coughs> excuse me, it's borrowing the thread of control in order to be able to run the request. So that's just a direct call. Likewise, if the caller is in a separate thread of control, again, the thread will be borrowed. This is what's commonly called a co-location optimization. So it's taking advantage of things when they're co-located in the same address space and it's removing a lot of overhead, which is great. It's exactly what you want. Conversely, if you invoke operations on objects that run in a separate address space, like another process, then the semantics are slightly different. Rather than just calling it directly, which it can't do because it can't get to the memory in the other process directly, instead what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and do all the steps that we just talked about to marshal up the data, send it down through the different layers, and it'll pop up the other side. And it'll be run in a thread from a pool of threads. So the key thing to remember there is when you start calling things that are going to run remotely with AIDL and binder RPC, you have to make sure your objects are thread safe, that they've got the proper synchronization. And we'll take a look at some examples of how to do that. Uh, and then you, you know, the return value goes back the other direction. The behavior of one-way methods changes the semantics a bit. The main difference being that when you do a one-way method, it doesn't block the caller all the way until it gets to the other side. In fact, it's kind of a fire and forget model. It just sort of says, okay, I, I pass it off to the underlying operating system on the client side, and then I return. And that call continues, but I, as the client, am not obliged to wait any longer for the data to, to occur. So it returns right away, and then there is no actual return value. Now, just to be confusing, uh, if you end up doing a one-way call that's co-located in the same address space, then that is actually going to be a two-way call in the sense that the call doesn't return to the caller until the method finishes running. But there will be no return values that come back or, or out parameters. So these are typically compromises people make just to simplify the implementation and, and make it work in ways that are going to be optimized, not always necessarily semantically consistent, but optimal and easy to implement. OK, so to summarize this particular discussion, uh, AIDL is the interface definition language that we use. And, and Android uses it to generate code. And this code allows us to be able to have multiple processes communicating back and forth on the same piece of physical hardware, the device. Uh, keep in mind, again, that there's no reason to be limited to that in general. That's just the way that Android does it. And if you end up talking between processes that run on different processes, or you end up talking between processes on the same machine, then it's going to have to generate the code. The AADL compiler will have to generate code to do the marshaling and demarshaling. And that was the stuff that we looked at. That's the stuff you don't have to write. Uh, the only way you would end up writing code like that is either if you're going to write a parcelable class, in which case you have to fill in the read from message and write to message hook methods, and they would do all those steps. Or if you don't want to use AIDL and you're going to encode the data through some other means, like uh, something that you would, like a parcel that you would use if you were going to use messages and messengers. Um, let's see. Whoops. Oh, that's annoying. Hold on. Let me get rid of this. All right. So. The interface definition language that's defined by 
by Android is very similar to Java. It's also very similar to Corba and Microsoft IDL and so on. It's a little bit lighter weight. They don't provide all the, the full-blown bells and whistles that some of these other more powerful things do. And it basically uses these proxies in order to be able to send the, the values back and forth without having to worry about address space issues. And as I mentioned before, if you do a little searching in Android, you will find lots and lots and lots of examples of AIDL used to pass information around for lots of things. And that's because under the hood, Android is set up to do a lot of communication between different processes. So that can be handled in a way that's very transparent to the applications for the most part. Um, but it allows for much greater flexibility in how the system is configured and how the system is able to be moved around and co-located or remoted without changing the way in which the code is structured. Okay, so any questions about that?